All right. Sit back, relax. It's time for another Laneway Talks. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Laneway Talks. And today we're going to talk to Marcus Knight, uh, who essentially is not signed to Laneway Music, but we do use him on very specific projects to help our artists and to work with them and mentor them. Uh, He's been in the music business for a long, long time. Um, I met Marcus probably 15 to 20 years ago and we've worked together ever since. Marcus, how are you? Doing really well, Ben. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. Um, Marcus, what we usually do uh, with our artists, even though you're not one of our artists, is we try to explore first how they got into the music business. So I would ask you to just give us a bit of a background because I'm actually not even aware of how you got into the business and... um, you know, are you specifically a musician? Are you a DJ? Are you a producer? So let's go back to the beginning, Marcus. Uh, yeah, I've certainly, I've certainly worn a few hats over the years. In my younger days, I very much started as uh, a music fan, uh, obsessed with old funk and disco. In the early days, I, you know, we couldn't afford to, you know, do any music lessons or anything like that. So I, uh, basically I had to wait till I got a, a part-time job in my teen years to purchase my first instrument, which was a keyboard, and I became a self-taught, I would say confident musician, but I was very curious about songwriting and, and, and lyrics and storytelling. That was my first passion and I suppose phase one of pursuing uh, a career in, in, in the music industry and being part of the music community. Yeah. Uh, How old were you then? When, so you basically took up keyboards first. How old were you? Yeah, I was about 14, 15. <laughs> I, was, I was waitering part-time uh, outside of high school and uh, putting away all my hard-earned money towards buying an instrument. I had no interest in going out or you know doing anything like that. I was very much uh, focused on wanting to pursue uh, music and, as I mentioned before, just very curious about you know how to... In the workout court structure, and, uh, and very much trying to initially mimic all my heroes at the start musically, uh, trying to work out you know how do they get from you know the structure into the pre-chorus structure and the chorus structure. So I was very very curious, quite young. So um, well, tell me, did you did you form a band or were you just on your own? No, I was very much alone for the first three four years. I uh, after purchasing a keyboard, I purchased my Afghan four truck uh, back in those days yeah. and bought a, a drum machine and just started overlaying parts so that I could essentially just start to produce, albeit uh, quite ordinary, come to think of it now, you know, just early beats. But it was very, very important for me to develop, turn my curiosity uh, and mix it with early work ethic. Well, were, so you, I would, were, were you trying to develop this into... I want to play live. Is that what essentially you were doing, or you more just right? I, I, I honestly, Vince, at the time, I didn't know what it was going to be. Um, it was very much pure love and curiosity around music um, and a fascination around, you know, how do things come together the way they do. I, I, I very much early on started to, uh, again, I use the word curious because I think it's really important when you're learning music and yeah. uh, learning how to produce and, and well, music direct the band for that matter. But I was very much, I think spoiled was probably the word, you know, some really amazing songwriters and producers when I was quite younger having a, a really good moment, you know, from, you know, Quincy Jones was an early hero of mine, you know, obviously Teddy Riley, not long after that was that new Jack Swing sound that he came up with. So it was a really good period for those who had an, a sort of a natural love for, you know, for R&B, soul, hip-hop, which is very much where I sat at that time musically. Yeah. And essentially at the time, as I said, I didn't know what I wanted to do with it. And as I kept writing songs and, and producing a lot more music, once I kind of got confident enough, I started to feel like I wanted to share and network with people who are like-minded individuals, other songwriters, other producers, up-and-coming artists. And essentially what I started to do was started to write and produce for other acts. Well, t- t- well, well, tell me, what was your first ever show that you played? My at? first ever show, oh, goodness, it was the Evelyn. And who, do, who did you, and who, who, who was the band? What, what was it? The band was called Touche back in 1990. Five, I think it was only four, maybe. Gee, um, that, so was... that name just blends in with. I was just talking to uh, Craig from Mother Goose, who around that right. time had a band called Quando Quando. <laughs> 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 oh, 
I get a similarity uh, yeah. there. Yeah, we were all, you know, everyone was trying to search for the cool name at the time. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we, it was basically myself and two other, two other members, female singer, and another producer, and I was basically DJing with keys and also doing a, a, a bit of hip-hop MC work in the background. So what, uh, what, did you, and, what did you feel like? I mean, going to a gig, you're playing the gig. What was the vibe like? You've come up, you know you love music. You, as you say, you've got the creative juices going. What was it like going up on stage? I th- I think it was very, at, at the time, we were just hungry to be in front of people, test out our material. It yeah. was all original. Yeah. We weren't doing any covers. And, you know, we, we have to remember back then, you know, hip-hop and R&B was, were not genres that were played on major radio. They were very much, you know, uh, you know, played by community radio, Triple J, PBS. Yeah. You know, uh, pe- PBS was very much a, a station that was embracing emerging Melbourne acts at the time and was very, very important to that genre. Yeah. So part of our initial, you know, part of a lot of the groups and bands that I got involved with at the time, whether I was writing for them, producing or, or part of the act for whatever time I was part of them, was yeah. we viewed community radio as a very important outlet for us to test out a material, you know, try and build fan base and convert any airplay into taking that story to being used to score well, it's, well, it's, it's an industry it, it, it's interesting to talk like that because you do get for everybody out there you do get the musicians that transition directly to a major label who get signed mm. they've done very little and they just get signed you know whether they're super talented or for whatever reason and then you get what you're talking about the it's the blood and guts i call it in that you've got to really use all your um avenues available to you to get your music out there and to explore it and to get you know get the feedback and all all that comes with it and community radio was extremely important i mean do you see that what was happening there has any similarity to what's happening now i think the social media has probably taken taken a lot of that space or that responsibility on Mm. uh, into um, unearthing um, you know, uh, emerging acts, yeah. whether it, it be from the mainstream pop world um, into the, the more, you know, call it niche genres, you know, uh, I think it's become very, it's certainly unearthed uh, yeah. some of the uh, biggest artists in the world. And so I, I think the difference back then to now was there were a number of platforms, both online and traditional, that allow more acts to get noticed. Um, I think the concept of you know, doing the slog and the, and the gigs and the touring and getting that groundswell of community radio to play mm. at, back in the 80s and 90s. By the time you got a record deal, it, you've really done the slog and, yeah. you've, and you've gone through a journey. So it was never running the sprint. It was always running a marathon. Yeah. You know, in most cases, I mean, sure, there was a few overnight successes here and there, but when you got a record deal back then with a major or a major indie, it really did mean something a lot more uh, than it does these days in the sense that you really needed to slog um, and do the apprenticeship. Yeah. I mean, I think that I tell a lot of artists that, that we have on Main Way, and we started as a heritage label, uh, but we're transitioning across everything now, but that uh, I do get the comments, oh, you know, back then, back then. Well, for me, Marcus and it may differ from what you think, is I don't think there's many differences because back then you had the assets that you had available to you. You could play four nights a week. You you, you know, you could do, uh, you, you had your um, magazines, which, you know, it was a lot easier to get a review in than it is today because magazines are more zines online, harder to get to, you know, editors and whatever. But then you get to today where it's easier to record and so you can, you, the creative side of getting the music available to the public's easier than what it was back then Uh, but there's not as many gigs but then you've got social media which was like our you know our jukes or whether it was you know all the other magazines that were there beat and impress and whatever and so to me yes there is there's this new transition to digital but it was all available back then but in a different form and you still had to slog it out and now you still need to slog it out and you need to have that day-to-day grind to want to get that success and you just need to do it day in day out and i find that very difficult to translate to young people that it isn't all uh, you know glory and gold and whatever it's the day-to-day grind i've got to do the same tomorrow what i did today i need to check my statistics i need to get up i need to check all my stats um during the day we have our you know 
platforms which we go on and we push out our social media. We then at night check all our social media. We have during the day the A&R work and we have our, you know, whether it be mixing or whether it be mastering. It is the same each day, but uh, you, the, the joy I get out is that I can listen to some music that nobody else has listened to yet. And I find that an aphrodisiac. And I, Absolutely. I just can't wait when someone sends me say for example a tape goes back to 1977 some quarter inch tapes and they haven't been played since back then and they've never been released and i go i'm just bloody excited about the whole thing but i you know essentially going back to what was happening then what's happening now yes it's digital and it was analog back then but i still think the same principles apply and there's in actual fact marcus i tend to think it's easier today to have success than it was back then because back then there was probably more money involved in trying to push yourself whereas today as a young person they are so savvy with social media that getting that initial push can come a lot easier than what it ever could have come before but again it's the grind day in day out but we get back to you and say uh, you know what do you what do you think the music scene is compared to the underground scene so let's think of two things we have pop rock whatever that comes with all of that blues and all that and there's the music scene and there's an underground scene to that too then you've got electronic music and there's your commercial scene or let's call it the accessible accessible scene and then there's an underground scene do you, do you kind of get what i'm saying what 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 do you see as the differences there oh, look i I think what's really interesting around the underground scene, you know, if we talk electronica for a moment, mm. you know, there's so many subgenres of electronic music, which is amazing. I find there are some countries in, around the world that can sustain healthy economies for a number of subgenres of electronic music, from tech house to techno to trance, side trance, drum and bass, um, bubble house, disco, yeah. and, and so on. It doesn't end. And the amount of acts globally that can sustain a great career in all those separate lanes without actually having a crossover hit, mm. it's, qu- it's quite astonishing how well they're going and how lucrative it's become. But it does require, in today's day, and it's to your point around digital and, and work ethic, it does require a constant amount of new releases coming out and quality for that matter. And But the work ethic behind, again, to your point, social media, a new release, literally, you know, there are guys like Uncle Grey in the UK who are putting out. Yeah. At least, if it's on remix, it's an original track. At least once every four to eight weeks, there's a new track coming out. He's feeding his brand with new material constantly. Um, and what, what it's doing is that it's real, I suppose, going back to his base audience, giving them something new and grabbing new fans along the way in different territories. And, you know, 30 years, you know, 30 years later, the, the guy is touring pretty much every, I suppose, uh, Almost every country in the world that embraces his genre on an annual basis mm. and selling merch and doing all those things, which I find quite amazing. And in that time, he's had one crossover hit, mm. which was The Weekend, uh, back in, I think, 2004, 2005. I think in the space of a 30-year 30, 30 career, to have one crossover song. Did I release that but, song? I think I did. Liberator. Yes, you Yes, yeah, yeah. he certainly did. Isn't that interesting? Um, you know, I released that song. Great record, but to this day, he's putting up so much material. Yeah. Um, and, it's, and so, to your point, it is really about work ethic and really feeding your brand um, with just new material and new content is very much king. Well, I, I can um, say to you, artists, I find talking to young artists, get about the older artists, they definitely don't get it, that the new world... Do not talk to me about an album. The album essentially is dead. It's gone. Uh, Yes, we might put out 10, let's call it 10 singles, and then we might um, put it together as one product. Okay, we'll call it an album. But the old uh, way of doing things, we spend a year on an album, they're dead. But I'm amazed at how many young artists I talk to now who I have to explain that we need new product every four to six weeks. And, yeah. and and that, you know, and and stats do show that you probably don't want to go any further than eight weeks. That's the maximum. So you really want to yeah. do that four to six. And you need to sustain that 
for at least 12 months. And the correlations that we know with our statistics are very clear. If I if I get an artist, whether it be a heritage artist or a young artist, if we work on that artist uh, with releases, let's call it every six weeks, and we put them out and we market them and we get them to do their social media because the artist has to conduct social media interaction themselves or else there's no hope. It can't just be the record label. But So if they're all doing that combined, I guarantee them that live shows will come their way. It, it is amazing, and it definitely correlates. Um, very, oh, look, very much. And I mean, I, you know, I mean I'm, I'm certainly living proof at times over the years where I've had a really good run um, of, you know, a combination of remixes and originals, you know, probably around between 2006, 2013. I had a huge run once I started making electronic music where um, it was really evident that the market was was reacting. And I think, you know, promoters aren't silly. You know, venues aren't silly. They see things being embraced. Mm. Um, and the crowd really having an appetite for something, they'll do their research and they'll find out, you know, who is who is that band, who is that DJ, and we need to get them in. Well, um, it it, it so. works, and I do have some acts where they try to get there too quick, so I go through this whole yeah. process with them, and two or three songs in, they'll go, right, I'm, I'm um, trying to plan a run, whether they're going to Sydney or Brisbane or wherever, and trying to plan a run, and I go, it's too early. And they go, oh, well, you know, I think I can, I'm can. i really getting some activity now, and I go, it's too early. You need 12 months. You need to play it through. Yeah, and I think that's probably reflective of how quick um, society is by nature. This day and age, everything is happening so quickly um, that there are a lot of acts that are trying to move their careers at the same pace yeah. and feeling, and that, that, I suppose that, sense of wanting to be validated as soon as possible to feel like they're getting an outcome that they think they're entitled to at that moment in time. Um, and it sort of does go back to that whole scenario of, you know, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon and, you know, producing quality. Music is one thing um, and being consistent with that is, is probably the call of the day at the moment. You know, now, now industry to build a career without relying on that magical hit that for some acts, you know, you know, acts like the Tesky Brothers, um, I find fascinating, you know, haven't had a hit, but they've done the grind and they're so consistent with their work ethic mm. that they've built up such a big fan base around the world and they're selling out shows. Um, yeah, you know, well, I, I got a question here, you know, how do you know when a song is a hit? Now, um, there's a lot of answers to that, but I was discussing something with an artist just recently, a new signing to two lane way, so nothing's out yet. But um, I the music, and he was more of a mature guy, a you know, mature artist. And I said, now there is no, you are, n- we are not going to break a mature artist. It's very difficult, and there's a few things to this, Marcus. Um, you know, it gets back to the question: When do you know something's a hit? But uh, there's one thing to say: If someone comes to me with an Aerosmith type rock band, well, unless you're in your twenties, you can just forget about it. I don't, I don't even want to contemplate any form of success. Because, and you say it's a band in their forties; it's just not on the cards. Then, if you bring me someone who is doing country or blues or rhythm and blues, and they're a really mature female or a male or whatever. <laughs> There's plenty of scope. That, that genre of music doesn't have a age bracket placed on it and you can still do very well internationally. I'm not saying we'll break a hit, but it can do very well. Um, and then there's ones where I say it's the in-between. So if I was say to they're in between that 40 to 55 kind of age bracket and I go, the music sounds really good, I, I, I love it, and it's it's way too accessible, so commercial. Um and it's too much so, and unfortunately, because of your age, I need you to sway it a bit towards an indie type of style. Um, because the indie style, even in that age bracket, can still get them some traction with their core audience. Um, so uh, there's a few things like that. But then if I go back to the young, uh, uh, let's call it, where they really want success and they can have success, um, how do you know when a, a song is a hit? I think a lot of... I mean, as far as the overall outcome of, of, of becoming a hit, it does require many things to fall into place at the right time. Um, the, you know, 
first and foremost, it's got to be a great song. Um, you know, that's the most important component. Is it memorable? Um, is it easy to recite? To pass on that information to someone else for them to recite. Um, and that's what we're talking about in this day and age. Um, for someone to share it on social media on all their platforms, go, I've heard this song, I'm sharing it on my channel, that much I love it. For mm. someone else to embrace as well and grow that audience. So that's the one aspect. So it certainly needs to be lyrically and melodically very memorable mm. in my mind. But so, and that's always been the case from the Beatles mm. Um, You know, every now and then there are those, you know, you know, very creative out of the ordinary composition that break the mold that probably, you know, wouldn't fall into, you know, that framework of being as memorable. But sometimes the storyline is just so good that people just start talking about the storyline. What's the defining moment in a song that you, you look for? My answer's evolved over the years because I think pop music has evolved um, so much in terms of arrangement and format and, and lyric matter. Um, if I had to say it now, it's definitely, it's, you know, you need a great hook. Um, you know, whether it be a vocal hook, uh, a musical hook, uh, an amazing hook needs to exist, again, to be able to recite. Mm. Um, and it needs to be simple. Um, you know, the big songs are simple, you know, um, especially in, like in, in terms of the, the pop chart, you know, great vocal hook, one music hook to follow the vocal hook. Um, and, you know, so, some of the drums and bass lines can almost be re-sung, or, so, or, so, memorized, mem- memorized and performed mm. by the common punter on their own. If you look at a track like Billie Jean, yeah. as an example, yeah. as soon as the beat starts, people know what song it is. Yeah. It's frightening. Yeah. You know, when the bass line comes in, you know, people know what song it is. What yeah. song it is. The string, the, the string arrangement's the same way. So, and that's within the one composition, which I find fascinating. Um, that's true mastery of craft right there as a, as a producer and as an arranger. Uh, but there's all the things, the other things around it as well, which is, you know, the amount of music that might be around at that point in time, it sometimes, you know, um, in terms of radio back in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, where we were much more reliant on the industry um, as, as an industry to rely on radio, um, if there was too much of one genre um, receiving airtime, it was mm. pretty hard to break through. Mm. Um, this day and age, was, you know, with Spotify and, and iTunes and, and getting on those playlists, there's so many specialty playlists that, uh, again, if the song's great, there's still an opportunity for things to grow organically online now. Uh, and that probably does open up a world of opportunities for a larger amount of acts to have success at the same time. Oh, I agree. As opposed to, as opposed to you know, 40, 50 years ago. Yeah. Um, so it's certainly, it's certainly fascinating. But I think what is, is a little bit different now, we went through this little period, which I find fascinating, where in the 80s and 90s, to mm. your point where albums were so big, mm. radio stations back announcing the artists and who they were playing, you know, when they were touring, whether there was an album coming out, if the first single or second single just came out from the album. So there was a real championing of a career on radio. And as it moved into the digital world, radio stopped back announcing artists, um, for, you know, and really hasn't recovered since in my mind. So in terms of how digital has taken over that mantle of, um, I suppose, obviously playing the music or providing a platform for people to find new music, I think that's what's become interesting. The fact that the punk has more control now to come across new music, save it to a playlist, and in essence, they're forming a relationship with that artist. If that artist then becomes consistent in music releases, I, th- I think that. Um, uh, well, actually, before I get to what I'm about to say, I'll give you a story about radio. Is just recently someone had t- told me they'd gone for a job at radio at one of the major radio stations, and um, uh, the <coughs> HR person said to them. Now, I want to know, uh, I want a truthful answer to this. And this was a young person. Um, do you listen to radio? And I said, well, how's that relevant? And they said, well, I want to know, do you do you really listen to radio? And the person said to them, told me that they said, uh, well, not really. I you know, have Spotify and, and whatever. And they said, oh, thanks very much. That was it. Yeah. And I thought, are, are you kidding me? I mean, seriously, how could you ask, ask a young person and you're trying to employ them, do you really listen to radio? Who listens to radio anymore? Are you kidding me? I mean, they don't break any new music anyway. I mean, that's a fact. Yeah, I, I, 
look, I, I, well, look, they, they break very, they break very little, mm. um, and that's because it becomes so risk averse because they're very much driven by how many, how much advertising dollars they can track to their station to make a profit for the year. Yeah. So you know, their objectives uh, and unexpected outcomes are influencing the content in the middle, and you know, hence why you know your talkback radio stations are doing so well. Mm across the board mm. and it, the only music stations that are doing really well at the moment is the kind of your heritage type acts you mm. know uh, of stations you know so called the Fems and Smooth are doing really really well in, in the radio as far as Australia's concerned well tell, um, well tell me something let's just move on a bit and go well how do you compare the local industry to the overseas industry it's a big question it's a it's a big big question I, I think you know the basic America, answer money but put that aside yeah sure I mean, the, the one thing that unites us all is the fact that, you know, the music economy has evolved uh, for better or worse in various ways over the years. You know, some things have become a little more lucrative in terms of touring and ways to monetize your tours, uh, I think, has changed. So there's a lot more opportunity in that, in that sense. Yeah. Um, as I said, there's, a, there's a, a, a big embracement of subgenres in different, you know, main genres, if you like, which I find fascinating. Yeah. Um, but... I do think what you know what's very interesting as far as the territories like the United States is concerned is when hip hop came in in, in the eighties and, and really broke Middle America in the in the night. Yeah. Um, that was a big turning point right there in terms of forming a, a permanent place in U.S. culture. Now, it was the voice of protest uh, at the time. It really did mean a lot to a lot of people at the same time within the community. And it really hasn't gone away. It's only become bigger and, I suppose, blended with other genres, in, including EDM and country music and all the rest of it along the way. So it sort of reinvented itself. But hip-hop being a huge factor in the United States, and it's such a big thing now, and it's really lasted the test of time into breaking radio, being commercial at times. Well, the, um, well, but the also, various forms, by being commercial, the various forms of hip hop. Correct. You know, so that, that, that's been really fascinating to me. Um, I think the content has changed in terms of the, the lyrics around it. Mm. So, you know, there's a lot less talk about the protest um, vocal or lyric from the 90s. You don't really hear it as much anymore. Yeah. You know, now they're, now they're talking about, you know, your, your typical topics of the day and wh- wh- whatever is considered sexy and cute. You know? <laughs> but you know, that, that I find fascinating. I, I think what I do miss about music from, you know, the 60s to the late 90s is there was a bit, I think, the substance of key changes and just, you know, just the journey of, of songwriting was very, very different. We were, we were very lucky in that sense. And now the, the, the chord structures are, are, are quite quite repetitive, um, but the arrangements are a little bit smarter to make sure that there's impact happening a lot quicker. And that's, again, because, well, this is my assessment of it anyway, because society moves so fast as an innovation, mm. so people want to hear the hook as quickly as possible. So I remember when Spotify and, and Apple really took over um, the agenda, the radio edit that I was doing for certain acts once upon a time, if I had to recut those in today's market, I would have to recut them very, very differently, um, which is fascinating. I mean, you know, uh, for, for, for my take on uh, on the overseas and here, and I think for me, the very late 60s, 69, 70, into the late 70s, 77, Sex Pistols, to me, it was evolving so quickly. Music was so creative that you had a very much anti-establishment um, voice coming out, and that would have been through Flower Power and then through the punk rock and whatever. Mm. And then you got the 80s, which became all that um, glam and whatever, and there was no anti-establishment in anything. It was all basically follow the leader. Uh, then you got to what you've talked about is the hip-hop, which then moved from, I suppose, the late 80s into the late 90s and then developed into four or five different branches of hip-hop and hip-hop could be. And I, I tend to find... I, with artists that I speak to for with Laneway, I always say, don't hold back. If you're anti-establishment, do it. If you want to swear, swear. Mm. I, I, I said, give it, give it your all. It's about everything. This woke, this whole woke society forming, and um, you know, because I've never been sexist. Uh, we do look for more female artists. I, I, I just don't, I don't adhere to it in the sense that well, I was never there, and I don't think we should all bend over and get on our knees and just say thank you thank you thank you and sorry we did all that it's about Mm. just tell the story and don't worry about what someone's going to think about you Uh, but that to me is that's my way because you know i'm very much 
anti-establishment. But, you know, music has become very formulaic and very direct in that it follows the leader. Now, that's what I'm thinking at the moment. I, you know, Sticky Fingers, if you read what's just happened with Sticky Fingers, uh, I tend to, to agree. I mean, there, there is no excuse to go out and be racist and, uh, you know, and everything else that the lead singer was doing. There's just... You just can't do that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, one there's one thing to go out and do that and get drunk and be on drugs. And, uh, you know, we don't we don't go into all of that stuff. But there's another one to talk about it in your song. And I don't think you should be blacklisted if you're talking about whatever you want to talk about in your songs. But you can't go out and just uh, basically abuse somebody and be racist, sexist, all that kind of stuff. But, again, it's, that's my opinion. And um, Yeah, I, I look, I've always looked at, you know, I've been asked a few times over the years or, you know, been asked why I've my thoughts on it. And, you know, whilst music is expression, freedom to express something, you also have a responsibility when you are when you are reaching a lot of people and you are having any influence on, you know, especially the impressionable part of society. Um, there are people that are, you know, I'm vulnerable at times and hang on every single word of some art that gets created. So the trade-off is, yes, you want, to, you want to speak your mind. You don't want to feel like you want to hold back. But at the same time, you know, uh, and this is my personal opinion of it, do you do this through a lens of, okay, if I had, tomorrow morning I woke up and I had a million fans and of those million fans, a segment of them were mentally and emotionally vulnerable um, and hung on every word I wrote within a song. How would my song affect them? Would they potentially do something to themselves that they wouldn't have otherwise done? Um, what responsibility do I hold within that process? So it's a really, I, I don't have all the answers around this other than I've personally tried to take the line of, you know, how would this affect someone that, that is vulnerable? Um, it's a very, it's very, a, yeah, very noble of you, you know, and um, there, I like the bit about the response Responsibility, and there is a responsibility when you're, you're musical. I, I think something else I wanted to say too was that what I've noticed uh, with the world being available to us at our fingertips from a musical perspective, I mean, um, yeah. there there is still very few great artists. It's interesting. I, I, I love discovering new artists, but it's hard, Marcus, I've got to tell you. It's hard. I'm on there with, I think, Spotify, say whatever they've got, I don't know, 90 million tracks or whatever. But it's still hard finding some really good artists. There's a lot of rubbish up there and really a lot of ordinary music. And I think, oh, my God. Um, and, and look, there reminds the challenge because, you know, because it is so easy to put up content. There is such a saturation of releases and therefore it's creating a challenge for some who are really quite amazing to poke through the saturation of music that's out and available. So, so we, do, we we will miss things at times. There's no it, it, look. The, it's exciting discovering the new music, but gee, it's still yeah. it's still hard. And what do I look for? I, I I go back to what you said earlier. I look for the hook. Yeah. It's got to hook me in. And yeah. you know the old the old um, statement: if you haven't got me in the first ten or twenty seconds, you've lost me. And that's yeah. more relevant today than it ever was because we have our finger on that next button. And if you haven't got me in the first five or ten seconds, you're giving me one of those big intros, well, well, one of those long, no, I won't say big, long intros where it's building and it's building. I'm virtually on to the next song. and uh, Yeah, in a big way. It, it's certainly become a challenge for some acts who still would prefer to tell the story and pay the price at a time. Mm. Um, you know, there are some acts who just want, I suppose, to go, well, I'm, I'm going to do it the, the way society expects it at the moment. Yeah. And then hopefully over time, Bruno Mars being a, a really good um, example of this, where mm. look, his first three, four albums mm. were straight from the gut. That's right. Pure pop. Yeah. And, and it's done really well. Like, you could tell the guy was just an absolute genius on yep. writing and, and producing and so forth. And then his latest, you know, he's moved away from that. He's done his, you know, he's done this collaboration with Park Anderson. And, you know, it, it, it's, it, to me, it's that balance of he's making music he really wants to make now. Yeah. And it's it, it done so well. But if it didn't, I think he'd be creatively very, very satisfied 
that he's doing something he's always wanted to do there's, and without without limitation. There, there's a statement I've always made over the years to artists. Um, when you're starting out, you need to do as I tell you to do and then once you get up there, you'll be telling me what to do. And, <laughs> and, right. and that never changes, you know. Uh, there's always a there's always an exception, but essentially that never changes. So I just wanted to ask you, you know, so how do you see the music scene evolving over the next few years and where do you think it's going to go in the future? Um, you know, what's happening? Let's talk about more here in Australia. I think the growth of hip-hop will continue. Mm. Um, I can see that happening. I think uh, electronic will still continue. I do think there'll be a, a larger amount. I, I, I can see heavier rock music making a comeback at some point. You know, I just, uh, you I know, just, want, to, I just want to butt in on that because Dan, who does all our playlists has a, yep. a triple j playlist and i was having a listen to it the other day and we were having a chat about it because he 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 programs them all and i said man you know listening to that playlist rock is on its way back which is yep. which is very difficult for me to say that when i'm listening to triple j um or, yep. or double j you know and i said to him all the songs that you got programmed in there if this was five six seven years ago would have been quite poppy with that indie feel what they sound mm. like to me right now is they're on the edge of that rock again with a melodic a bit of a melodic feel in there definitely indie but that rock's mm. coming back in and i i it's just sneaking back in i mean it's doing that 360 there are a lot of great bands that are really starting to um grow fan bases um around the country and it's done break internationally as well without having a hit which I find fat, and, and they're not supposed to major labels either. Um, so this has been really fascinating for me to watch. You know, um, there's a band that I've been kicking on, Elijah and the Delusionals, um, who are just fantastic, mm. and just growing all the time. And there are a lot of bands like them that are really starting to, to make a mark out there. I can see there's a shift happening, and may not. I don't know how far it's going to go or suppose how it's going to evolve over that time, mm. but I can see it's going to, I feel like it's going to have a big place again. You know, we've, we've gone through a, a really big singer songwriter era yeah. of music, which has been great. We've been spoiled with, with some great Australian acts over the, the last 15 years. You know, Missy Higgins, Bernard Fanning, you know, or Kelly feels like he's been around since the early 1900s. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's been, a, we've had such a great amount of, a song writers, but I can feel like the band thing is really starting to take shape again, which is super exciting. Absolutely. I mean, here's another question. How do you mm. how do you think artists can maintain their musical integrity once they've been commercially successful? That's a really hard thing to do, and there's only my my answer to that, and I want to hear your answer, is essentially if the band stays true to themselves and remains independent and don't need a major label they will always be able to control that integrity level but if they can't and they move to a major label their integrity will always be compromised always what do you think uh, yeah look I, I think there are a number of ways of looking at this it's really about who blinks first right if your success means different things to different acts and songwriters and producers. You know, there are there are some who are just hell bent on being not great but amazing. Mm. And, you know, stopping at nothing to achieve commercial success and if that means they need to bend left or right to make it happen. Mm. Uh, it's a non it's a it's very much a non compromising attitude that they have. And that's fine because that's what they're after. I think when you're working within a niche, um, you know, it's that Thing of being staying tried and true to you know what you love, what inspires you, and having tenacity to, to to stay the course. With the trade-off being that you may never have the hit, but you'll have a try. You know, you'll have a true built-up fan base that will stay with you for the rest of your career. Yeah, uh, and, and, and that can be okay for a lot of apps as well. I think that's uh, good words of wisdom there. There's no doubt about it. What would you give as words of encouragement and wisdom to people who are keen to make a career in the music industry? Now, let's think about the music industry as being the creative side, the live side. We've got the uh, administration side. You know, you've got the commercial radio side. There, there's so many facets to the business. What would be your words of encouragement to young people who are 
trying to break into the business and remembering if you're an artist I tend to think it's a bit easier to assimilate and get involved in everything because you, you you're trying to be the artist up there and therefore you've got to try and learn everything but if you're not an artist it's a lot harder I, I think because it's there, therefore becomes a job that's anyway what do I think? What do you think? When, I, when I've spoken to emerging acts, um, or for those who are thinking about having to go, my advice has always been to, first and foremost, put yourself in a place where you can explore the explore your career in the music industry, but do it in a, do it in a way where you have some sort of a backup in place. Not for the sense of going, oh, I'm not you know, I'm probably not going to make it, whatever, making it is for that person. But it's being able to explore and be curious about the music industry without worrying how you're going to pay this month's phone bill mm. or how you're going to fill up your car with petrol. Mm. You know, especially with the cost of living in this day and age, it's probably more important than ever. So the one thing I can relate to is this. No, as, as from the day that I got curious about the music industry, I've always had a job. Mm. And that job wasn't always doing music full time at the very beginning. It was having the, having a little bit of financial stability to allow me to be curious and not stressed. And when you're not stressed, you, you tend to be able to think clearly, and you probably will make a lot better music with it as well. Don't get me wrong; there are artists who um, have managed to live week to week for a long time, you know, including busking, and be on, go on to become hugely successful. E.g., Tones and I. Mm. But by and large, you know, you know, I've always taken that question quite seriously with a sense of responsibility when I speak to young kids and say, hey, look, you know, music's great. It can be a really good part of and fulfilling part of your life. But it's not, it doesn't define you as part of it. So therefore, don't put yourself under that stress. Give yourself some security to be curious along the way and go hard and really give it a good go knowing that, you know, you're not going to start. Look, I think that, I mean, I'm very lucky I've been in the entertainment business my whole life. Um, I consider my... St- I mean, I still get up now and I'm 62 years of age and I get up every day and I'm... You look forward to being so you know, Yeah, I know. It's terrible. It's, uh, you know, it's a freak of nature that I look so young. But, you know, I get up every day and I'm super excited to try and think about what's on the agenda today. I, I, I just... I mean, it just never changes every day. Now, I'm, I've never really done drugs and it's a big part of this business and the ones that do can drift off there's no doubt you you know you know it's just it's it's a terrible thing um i did do a lot of booze and i don't drink anymore so that's helped me too I'm so, I don't smoke because nobody smokes anymore. But um, but you know I just it's it's never waned. Every day I, I was talking I was doing an interview a couple of weeks ago and I think for me it all broke with we were as kids we'd gotten our hands on the very first Kiss record. It was seventy three mm. seventy four. Nobody had ever heard of them here, and we played that record to death. The next one that I got was Judas Priest, Sad Wings of Destiny. They'd already had one album yep. out, which wasn't successful. This was their breaking record, and it really started to give them some exposure, and it just freaked me out, and it's never, ever stopped. It was going to the import stores just to discover new music. It was, how am I going to get into the music business? You know, I uh, went to university, did all my yada yada yaddies, and Michael Gadinsky giving me a job. And I remember Michael saying to me one day, you know, if you leave this business, you'll regret it. Don't ever leave, because you... You won't know how good it is till you're left and you'll, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. Um, yeah. luck, luckily, uh, I haven't had to leave it at all and I've, I've been through all facets of the business. But um, for young people, I tend to say the same thing as what you said, is that you need to have a backup plan. You you know, if you can go and get a degree first, um, I'm, I'm not a big professor of you've got to have a degree and all that kind of jazz because, no. you know, but have a backup plan and you've got to, as you use the word, you've got to be tenacious and it's got to happen every day and it can't wane. And it's the killer instinct and that killer instinct, for example, goes across to, let's call Aussie rules footballers. If they don't have the killer instinct they they will not survive i mean i was reading some articles on a couple of players that have um, quit because they just didn't have the killer instinct they didn't didn't have it and um and it, it and it comes across here and it's it's enjoying that music and the discovery of that music so you know um uh, you 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 constantly ring me with new music that you're either working on or you've discovered and i mean that's how it should be all the time 
that trading of ideas uh, or, you know, whether I need you to mentor an artist and, you know, we need to get the best out of the artist. And it's, to me, it's the creative juices that continually flow out. And um, I think people like yourself who are in, in the industry live and breathe it. And, you know, it really does shine out and you've got the best of both worlds. You can work in the admin side to, you know, even... Um, creating your own music or whether you're producing music or you're mentoring and so I think you're getting a bit of everything which is fantastic um, yeah I, I, look I've been like yourself I've been really fortunate and continuously grateful to be part of the music community I still get just as excited very similar to yourself when you, when you occasionally you hear that an amazing track coming out of nowhere Mm. And it's innocent, you know. It's, it's the one moment that happens occasionally where you almost remember what it felt like to listen to music the first time and go, this is great, this is mm. special. Mm. And it doesn't need to be a hit all the time, which is, you know, like, there's a couple of tracks I heard uh, last year. And that was, there was a lot of amazing music written during lockdown in particular yeah. Yeah. That, I, that I've received over the last two years. And it really was a time where people really had the time, uh, not voluntarily, obviously, but they had the time to create and become great, you know. To me, that's the whole notion of, you know, you can't be just good, you can't be just great, you need to be amazing, and you need to work up to being that level continuously once you get there. And that period during lockdown, I think it's unearthed some great songwriters and will continue to get or receive amazing music because people became great during that period. That suffering um, and that anxiety that we all, you know, as a, as a as a, as a world went through, I think also manifested the time to allow people to explore um, their curiosity around becoming creative practitioners, if you like, whether as a songwriter, as a producer, as an artist. It was a really interesting period, and I think we're just seeing the surface of what that's actually going to deliver in the future. That's what I'm excited about, actually, is, you know, when you, when you say to me, you know, what do I see in the future, apart from rock music making a meaningful comeback mm. in terms of the big band, I also think the level of musicianship and songwriters We'll go to another level again. Look, I really do. The, the, the world has changed. I, you know, if I come back from the office on a Friday and um, I'm riding home on the motorbike and I see the roads are empty and I think, what yeah. the hell's going on here? And now we're in this into this. Pe- uh, people don't go into work on a Friday and there's less cars no. on the road. And the well, world, Thursday's and Thursday's, Thursday is the new Friday. Yeah. And, it, and the world has changed and there's there's a, a lot happening out there and there's, I just, you, you've got to move with the times. I We got it back in the, I suppose it was the late 90s, early 2000s when the music business was transitioning to digital. Everybody used to say to me, well, how do you feel about that? You know, what about your future? I used to chuckle. Um, at the time, I was actually at shock and I was trying to start a, a digital radio station, which was so, yeah. in its infancy, but unfortunately I'd, I'd left and then go and start some labels with Michael. and um, But it never worried me. And you look at newspapers and how they were all screaming because it's all going digital and the journos are losing their jobs. And it's like, we've been through all that. And then you've got TV, their revenues are dropping because, you know, free-to-air TV doesn't have the attraction that uh, cable or, you know, subscription does. But you're starting to get, you know, YouTube is starting to blitz everybody and even whether it comes to TV or whatever or in any kind of vision format. And so there is so much happening that you have to embrace it and move on with it and so I don't get scared with any of it because there's got to be something in it for me there somewhere Marcus I'm not sure where but there's something in it but you know laneway music is pursuing it at a rate of knots and we and I get complimented from um, some of uh, you know our older artists who say you you're giving a platform for us guys who are really good musicians but nobody really cares about anymore well they don't care because they don't know how to get out there, so we're doing that. But, you know, it's it's change and there's you've got to run with that change and embrace it. And, um, you know, and that's where I like working with yourself. Uh, new ideas don't, don't scare you whatsoever and we often have a chat about it and whatever. Anyway, so I don't know if you feel the same, but, you know, that's I'm very excited about the whole future. <laughs> I, th- I think the rate of change because of, you know, destruction through technology has probably, you know, understandably caused a lot of anxiety over the years. And, and that's reasonable for a lot of people to feel that. You know, I, I think at the time, you know, the bigger, you know, entities would feel the impact of it a lot quicker than, you know, your average 
artists, uh, independent artists especially, that's just, because a decline financially to a, a major company or a multinational would be quite instant when, when there's disruption of that nature. So I could understand, you know, the amount of good people we would have lost over the year simply just through that anxiety. Mm. Um, mm. But at the same time, every time it's happened, it's unearthed a new way of, of, of operating, creating new ways of working and creating new opportunities. And now, to your point, you know, there is a whole bunch of new ways to develop, produce and distribute music more than ever before. I think where Laneway has just been so important, you know, as you mentioned, is it's just giving a home to those musicians who, you know, in any other time, you know, some of these musicians were going, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm happy for this music to, to sit in the vault and not do anything. Yeah, and you know, to have a label, a label like Laneway exist, I think validates and embraces that was created at a moment in time, um, telling stories from that particular era. Which I, I think it's on its own. It, it's quite a fascinating proposition. As someone that you know, I, I get immersed into watching all sorts of documentaries uh, from the music industry into into mm. politics and so forth. And I think what Laneway is really important is just that just giving that that platform and a home to a really important part of Australian music culture. It's no, no, look, we, we see it the same way. And um, as I say, we have artists who are always giving us compliments like that. But, you know, what Laneway is doing now and it's it's a natural progression. We're moving to a lot more other genres, but other age bracket of musicians. So we're moving into those younger musicians. And and it, I think it's for some. It not all young musicians are social media savvy and know what to do. My my comment I make to all young guys is you do need someone like Laneway to put your music out because you need to stay creative. You don't want to have to worry about the administration of getting it up. On online and knowing when to schedule it and whatever the formats are and getting your video ready and all that kind of stuff you you need to stay creative and it goes back let's just go back to what we started tonight with is that you really do need to put songs out every four to six weeks that means you've got to be pretty damn creative and those juices need to be flowing all the time but if you've got to do everything else let alone all your social media well it's to me it can be completely overwhelming so we're starting to move into that territory and help younger people too but we we have a new platform coming which we'll announce in probably two months time we're very excited about and that's to help another whole bunch of musicians but anyway that's more than enough for tonight it's been fantastic talking to you uh, Marcus and I'd love to talk to you again about uh, some of the artists of ours that you, you know you, you've worked with and, and are going to work with and help mentoring them or producing their tracks and whatever. And it's about trying to, I suppose, talk about how you're going to make a song. That would be actually a good topic I'd like to talk to you in a couple of months about is how how you how did you make a song into a commercial success right and you got it yeah. and what did you think about and what did you do and then what did you you know do with it and then how did how do we actually get it out there to let if it you know whichever genre it is to the marketplace in certain markets to try and get it to viral and yada 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 but we'll talk about that another time but it's been great talking to you and i hope to talk to you again soon it's been, uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, i look forward to our next chat yep your knowledge is very in-depth i must say thanks very much and uh, we'll talk to you soon cheers bye well, there you have it, another Laneway Talks. If you enjoyed that, just search Laneway Talks for more great conversations.